and um, I don't know if any of them are on, if any of the students are on, if you let me know in the comments, I know Carly might be able to get on. Um, but Michael Say, um, who co-authored with Andrew Zuz at the University of Arizona, um, his paper, Late Miocene Transition Between Basin and Range Extension and Walker Lane Tectonics in the Como Mining District, Northern Pine Nut Mountains, Nevada, New Insights from Geologic Mapping and Argon Argon Geochronology was the winning paper. So we will be awarding him $1,000 for his efforts. Um, a tie for second place was between Curtis Johnson, who if you guys caught our uh, second talk of the series, I believe, mm -hmm. Curtis gave his talk on his thesis um, and Benjamin Robinson, Curtis's paper was Carlin type gold deposits part of the Great Basin's unique Eocene melogeny, and Benjamin Robinson um, is, Curtis is out of the Craig program here and was one of my students. And Benjamin Robinson is under Mark Barton at the University of Arizona. And then we had a tie for third place as well. That was between um, Rocky Barker, who um, is at the University of Hokkaido, and then Carly Balau, who did her work at the University of Nevada, Reno under um, Peter Vickery and John Munteen. So each of those guys will be receiving a cash prize for their hard work. So if you see them, give them a big congratulations. And if you are working with any students or you were recently a student, submit for 2021. We'll be doing the papers again, as well as the posters and the speakers. But um, we had oh, yeah. a group. What are the, what are the deadlines uh, for abstracts? The abstracts are due. I think September October. 30th. Um, so all of you who didn't contribute for the 2020 uh, proceeding should contribute for the 2021. Oh, things are breaking up. There you go. You're back. Papers are due in November. Um, and we'd like to give a huge thank you to Roger Steininger, Vic Ridgely, Bill Pennell, Fleetwood Couts, Tony Ng, Chris Henry, Larry Garside, Odie Christensen, Mike Russell, and Paula Noble as they helped review the student papers. That was quite a list of student papers to review and get through. So thank you to everyone that did that. And um, yes, I will list out the students' names and their titles in the paper here um, in the comments so everybody can see that. And I'll turn it back over to Mike to get Chris going. Okay, Chris doesn't like bios, and I don't think he does bios, uh, but I'm going to do one for him and oh. probably skew it and be we're slanderous. Just, we're just wasting time. <laughs> yes. Oh, in this day and age, we have lots of time. <laughs> okay, well, I think uh, most everyone knows our speaker tonight, uh, Chris Henry. Chris has been mapping in nearly every corner of Nevada for the past 27 years or so at least that I've been in Nevada, and um, all at the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology. And when I say mapping uh, every corner, I mean that um, Chris maps all over the place, um, but he doesn't stop there. Um, he, he maps to address basic geologic questions, usually regarding magnetism, tectonics, stratigraphy, and ore deposits, and sometimes all combined. And, um, I think that's quite admirable, the, the amount of um, material that Chris gets published, and uh, a lot of it, uh, and all of it, really is field-based. Um, let's see here. Uh, many of the uh, corners that Chris has frequented um, include major mining districts, uh, including the Carlin Trend, the Southern Carlin Trend, Jarrett Canyon, Eureka, Stillwater, McDermott, Northwest Nevada, Long Canyon, many localities in the Walker Lane, uh, the Eocene Auriferous gravels uh, in Western Nevada uh, that uh, have possible links to the mother loan in California, and the focus of tonight's uh, talk, uh, Cortez. Um, did I also mention that Chris had another career uh, mapping all of West Texas by himself? Um, he got tired of that after they said he was to map East Texas. Um, let's see, what else has Chris done? Um, uh, that's, that's more than enough. 
Oh, I have more here. Um, uh, Chris recently retired from the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology. Um, I think that retirement is only on paper, and as Chris says, he doesn't get paid anymore. Um, he's busy uh, mapping uh, still. He's He's got responsibilities for mapping some of the quadrangles around Reno, and he's got a, uh, a heap of uh, data and uh, uh, work in progress papers that he's working on. And um, I feel very fortunate to have worked with and known Chris over many years now. And I think many here tonight feel the same way. So Chris, thanks for um, giving this talk tonight. And um, we look forward to learning more about Cortez. Okay, well, uh, I tell people also that my goal in life is to not die with a lot of unpublished data, and I'm working hard on that. Um, Zoom does have problems. I would say if, if things cut out, wave your arms madly, but since I can't see anybody, I don't know how that would work. Uh, let's see. Let's get started. Okay, um, here's our title slide. Nice picture of uh, Cortez Hills, the moon rising over Cortez Hills. It's got a title and then it's got a long list, but very incomplete list of uh, collaborators. Um, I'm the only really person speaking tonight, but the work in the greater Cortez area involved several other people. Uh, work other places involved many, many more people. I've uh, worked with and published with many of these people, and I just talked with a whole lot of people. And looking at the, some of the names that have come up on the screen uh, that are listening in, I realized I left out a whole lot of people. I should have just taken a picture of the GSN phone book and put it up here. Anyway, this is about Jurassic, uh, Cretaceous, Eocene, and Miocene magmatism and mineralization in the Cortez. And it's gonna be a, a two-part talk a long part about the Cortez area. Uh, and let me get my cursor working here. I hope you can see my little cursor waving around. Uh, the Cortez area, the Battle Mountain Eureka trend, uh, and its multiple episodes of igneous activity and hydrothermal episodes. And then I'm gonna use that to briefly discuss a few implications for uh, Cortez, excuse me, Carlin type deposits in general. And there's a bunch of major points I want to make, and I really want to emphasize a couple of them. Uh, Cortez area underwent multiple spatially superimposed episodes of igneous activity and hydrothermal mineralization. And this is the normal situation for the Great Basin. This, uh, we see this over and over again. Uh, and this complexity greatly complicates interpreting the age and origin of many deposits, and particularly Carlin-type deposits, which are notably difficult to uh, date. Um, what I call hidden intrusions, and I'll explain that during the talk, are very common in the Great Basin. And, and I'm gonna use some of this to explain uh, or what all this means for what I call the Getchell Twin Creeks Enigma. Anyway, so we're gonna uh, zoom in here to the Cortez area. Uh, and indeed, igneous episodes, uh, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and I mentioned here 109 million years, but in fact, there's a lot more than that, and then we'll see this in this talk. Two distinct episodes of in the Cortez years, 336, and then the Middle Miocene in Northern Nevada Rift. And I identify a geologic map of this area with a bunch of the uh, mines, you know, from some really big ones to some very small ones. Uh, in this area. It's a very mineral rich area. Um, and each of these igneous episodes has had major hydrothermal episodes with them. I'm going to run through things chronologically and to give examples of all these. Uh, some are more interesting than others, but just to point out that there is all uh, this multiple igneous activity and hydrothermal uh, mineral deposits. So we're going to start with Jurassic uh, and uh, there's the Mill Canyon uh, Jurassic intrusion here near Cortez bunch of uh, Jurassic intrusions and a big volcanic field going northeast through the Cortez Range, long ago studied by Pat Muffler and more recently by 
Sandra Wild and uh, Jim Wright. And we're now gonna zoom in on the Cortez area to look at some specific examples of Jurassic intrusions. Um, the Mill Canyon intrusion is a uh, varied quartz monzonite to granodire intrusion. Uh, it's accompanied by a lot of lamprophere dikes as well as porphyritic rhyolite dikes and more irregular bodies uh, that are developed at the contact between the um, main Mill Canyon intrusion and host rock. So this, for example, is a porphyritic rhyolite or porphyry. And I'm going to show a bunch of the dates on this. Uh, Jim Mortensen from University of British Columbia and others uh, published in the GSN 2000 volume got 158 million years by uranium-led thermal ionization mass spectrometry on zircon. And then the other dates are all our work from uh, uh, the shrimp uh, at the USGS Stanford Laboratory uh, and argon argon dating all done at New Mexico Tech. And so we have a, a date on the milk can intrusion here, 162. Right next to it is a lamprophere dike that comes out of uh, 160 million years. That's both of these are zircon dates. It's a biotype bearing lamprophere over here. It's actually in the, the gold rush deposit, 162 also. Uh, another lamprophere dike up here, both hornblende and zircon, right around 161 million years. And then this porphyritic rhyolite zircon date of 161 million years. Now, the Mill Canyon area, and here's Mill Canyon, and this area up through here has a lot of mostly small, a couple sort of moderate size deposits and mines. And previous workers logically, very logically, interpreted that these were Jurassic because of their spatial association with the Jurassic Mill Canyon intrusion. But it turns out that in fact, the, the major deposits here are actually Cretaceous and I'll sort of illustrate as that we go along. Uh, I looked at a bunch of these deposits, uh, partly with Bob Leonardson, trying to find datable material in them um, and, and found three examples. I'll talk about all three of them. Uh, a lot of them I didn't find anything and they're currently just undated and uncertain in their age. But the <clears throat> one thing that uh, of Jurassic that I did find is the Empire State Mine here. And this is just a, a picture of the mine, uh, Empire State. This, this, this here, there's some more workings over here. It's obviously not really big. It's a polymetallic vein in the Mill Can intrusion. Found some sericite in a vein on the dump here. Dated that as 160 million years. So it's definitely Jurassic. As you can see, it's not a big producer, $2,500 worth of silver, gold, lead, zinc, copper, pre-1910, and that's from Emmons' uh, report on all this. So that's the one dated uh, actual mine, but probably more significant mineralization is actually up here in the Northeast uh, in this Jurassic rhyolite or, uh, or porphyritic, excuse me, quartz porphyry, with a zircon date of 161, and it has a bunch of molybdenum-rich stockwork veins. And we'll take a look at them. Here's, uh, over here on the left, is a nice uh, outcrop of the stockwork veined uh, uh, quartz porphyry, very pretty rock, frankly. Uh, and here's a sawed slab of that uh, stockwork veining. And I used a handheld XRF to get molybdenum contents in the veins. And I did this because it's very heterogeneous, so I want to be able to do spot analyses as best as possible. So we got 3,000 ppm here, 2,100 ppm here, 960 here, 240 here, and about 60 over here. So very heterogeneous, uh, some pretty high uh, molybdenum concentrations, uh, but, but quite a range. Um, most likely, it's, this is in uh, molybdenite, but... Uh, I don't have thin sections yet. I have uh, uh, just a hand lens and binocular scope. I couldn't really uh, identify the molybdenum mineral. And this is uh, probably not economic, but nevertheless, it is some significant mineralization tied to the uh, Jurassic magnetism. Okay, now in contrast, um, there's a lot of exposure to Jurassic. There's almost no exposure of Cretaceous. In fact, uh, there's been a lot of mapping in this overall area, a lot of very good mapping, 
none of those maps show any Cretaceous rocks of any sort. Um, it turns out there is one Cretaceous dike. This was discovered right over here, uh, mapping by Tom Chapin working for Barrick, and they got a date with a lab in Germany, and it comes out uh, 114 million years, and we'll take a better look at this. But additionally, the combination of drilling and over here and Zircon's in acre intrusion right up in here. Uh, and that's long been known. Um, potassium argon dating done by uh, Silverman and McKee 50 years ago, uh, got some um, Cretaceous ages, a little bit uh, young, but, but definitely demonstrating Cretaceous. And more recently, uh, Mortensen again, uh, Zircon date. And um, Gold Acres has a lot of associated alteration. And this alteration has very much complicated the interpretation of pipeline, which is uh, right in here. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Okay, we're gonna again zoom into the Cortez area because there's a lot of Cretaceous there. And here we go. Um, couple drill holes, one fairly old one, an RC hole, so just cuttings. Uh, intersected a granodiorite at a depth of about one kilometer. Biotite from that gives a, a, a date of 104 million years. Uh, and that's a granodiorite in upper plate Paleozoic rocks. Uh, a more recent drill hole by Barrick went through the fault and into lower plate rocks and hit another granodiorite. That's this photo over here. Nice case bar megachristic granodiorite. Biotite from that gave 109 million years. So drilling alone shows these major granodiorites in the subsurface. Up here is the dike found by Tom Chapin and the date on it. And it comes over from Four Mile Canyon, see over here, over into Mill Canyon, then steps over and it actually makes part of the wall rock at the Berlin mine, which we'll talk about again in another minute. Probably some of the biggest Mesozoic mineralization is the Cortez Silver District right here and series of workings along through here. This is just a Google Earth image, oblique, looking east. Um, Cortez Hills is just off to our left, to the north. Um, and in the Cortez Silver District. Now, um, Cortez Silver District is a polymetallic replacement and vein deposit. Uh, more information from Emmons. Four and a half million ounces of silver, along with lead, copper, zinc, and only 24,000 ounces of gold. So very little gold in a really high silver-gold ratio. Um, uh, safety conscious barrack has blasted all the adits. So uh, we couldn't get it underground, but Bob Leonardson and I did find some very nice material on the dump here, including uh, sericite in a vein. Um, and that we have dated. And I promise there won't be many of these uh, argon, argon spectra, but there's one we're gonna look at here. This is first of all, the um, uh, biotite from that granodiorite, very well behaved, 109 million years. Two analyses of the sericite from the Cortez Silver District, um, 107 million years and 108 million years slightly younger than the 109 here, but the final steps in both of these are older and up to 109 million years. And the best interpretation of this is that the Cortez Silver, the sericite here from the Cortez Silver District is also 109 million years. The Cortez Silver District is a Cretaceous deposit and most likely driven by the 109 million year old granodiorite. So, um, Cortez silver, it's Cretaceous. Okay, uh, another place I was able to find uh, um, sericite is at the Berlin mine here, and I mentioned that uh, Cretaceous daysite dike makes part of the wall rock. It goes right along through here. 
and I found some very nice sericitized biotite, the main added here. This is a polymetallic replacement deposit, very similar to the Cortez Silver. Uh, Emmons reports $40,000 pre-1908 of silver, lead, and gold. And sericite from this deposit also comes out 109 million years old. And so this is also a Cretaceous deposit, a hydrothermal system, presumably driven by the 109 million year old granodiorite that we see in the subsurface. And I looked elsewhere around in Mill Canyon, did not find datable material. Bob Leonard and I spent quite a bit of time at Mill Canyon, Mill Canyon deposit, which is another replacement deposit, very similar to Berlin and Cortez Silver. Couldn't find anything to date. I, I think it is most likely also Cretaceous just because it is such similar mineralization to Berlin and Cortez Silver, but that's an interpretation. Okay, when we put all this together, you know, we've got drill holes here and here that go into Cretaceous rock, the dike that Tom Chapin found up here, Cretaceous mineralization at the Berlin mine, the Cortez district, so there's a lot of Cretaceous activity here, but that's just the start really for this area. What we also find is a lot of zircon xenocryst ze in Eocene dikes, uh, particularly a 39 million year old dike that's right down here, and then some of the Cortez rhyolites that we're going to discuss a bunch as we go along. And these zircon xenocrysts, these are obviously xenocrysts of zircon in younger rocks, and they've picked up the zircon as they've traversed through rocks that they intrude through. And we found a bunch of uh, xenocris, uh, Cretaceous ones. We found other xenocris also. Uh, but the age range we see here, this is simply a plot of age along here and number of grains, zircon grains analyzed here. And we find our age range from about 110 to 49 million years. Now, the interpretation of this, um, some of this could just be lead loss. That is, the zircon does not retain all the radiogenic lead. And I think, like these dates in here, they're just a few and sort of scattered, and maybe like this uh, date here, these are probably lead loss. In contrast, something like this, this real peak spike at 72 million years for nine grains, so tight, that's probably a true 72 million year old Cretaceous intrusion in the subsurface. It would be very coincidental if lead loss led to this tight grouping of 72 million years. And we see several others, 72, 84, 90, 94. The 102 and 107, these are probably the equivalents of the 104 and 109 million year old Cretaceous rocks that were actually drilled into. Uh, the plus or minus on shrimp, uranium lead, zircon dating is around one to two million years. So these would definitely overlap with that. And so we see a bunch of uh, Cretaceous uh, intrusions from the zircon xenocris. And that shows up here um, where I put on now uh, what all these are. Uh, 107 really matches 109, 104, 90. Then also 972 in this area, uh, zircon xenocris that are all right around 94 million years. So in this area, we've gone from an area where there are no Cretaceous rocks of any kind to recognize gold acres intrusion, to the further drilling, and then to lots of what I call hidden Cretaceous intrusions in the south subsurface. So this area without any Cretaceous outcrop is just shot through with Cretaceous intrusions. Uh, now, Cortez area is not a one-off. This shows up elsewhere, and that's what we're gonna look at next. Uh, this is from a very interesting paper by Fithian, uh, Holly, and Kelly on the Marigold mine, which they interpret to be a uh, Carlin-type deposit, sort of the northwestern part of the Battle Mountain area. And they also found a lot of hidden, both Jurassic and Cretaceous intrusions. The only outcrop there is a bunch of uh, plagioclase, biotite, hornblende, quartz, monzonite dikes. They did uranium lead uh, TIMS dating on them and got sort of two general ages, 92 and about 98. 
And in the 98 million year old, uh, they saw a lot of evidence for zircon xenocris. So they went back and did a lot of laser ablation, ICPMS zircon dating, and uh, they got a whole bunch of xenocris. Oh, and I forgot to mention, first of all, they recognized a Lamprefer dike, uh, about a two meter intercept at 1100 meters in a deep drill hole, 60 million years, perfect uh, match to the Cortez area. But then the xenocris also, they found 47 xenocris average out at 157 plus or minus 5 million years uh, within the Cortez area in the Carlin trend. And they also found 13 xenocris that are 108 plus or minus 4 million years. And this is distinctly older than these uh, quartz monzonite dikes and demonstrate uh, another major felsic intrusion in the subsurface. So here, uh, no outcrop of these rocks, but definitely major Jurassic and Cretaceous intrusions in the subsurface that, again, do not crop out. Okay, now we're going to go on to Cortez and the Eocene magmatism. And as I said, two episodes, 39 to 40 million years and 34 to 36. And in this area, nothing in between, but regionally, of course, we do see uh, igneous rocks of those ages uh, elsewhere in Nevada. Starting with the 39 to 40, this is mostly in the northern Shoshone range, particularly represented by three major granodiorite intrusions at Hilltop, Granite Mountain, and Tanabo. And aeromagnetic data and the distribution of Hornfels suggest that these are apophyses from a larger intrusion that encompasses the area in through here. So these are just shallow apophyses, a larger underlying intrusion. These are all granodiorites. Uh, they're accompanied by a lot of uh, compositionally equivalent andesite, dacite dikes. The only representative of this episode down in the southern area is a 39 million year old dike right here. And this was the source of many zircons. And we've got both argon, argon, and zircon dates on it. Notably, this igneous episode has no rhyolite. In this area, it's all granodiorite, andesite, dacite. No rhyolite. And that's an important point. There's a lot of mineralization in this area, uh, variably described as uh, early weak porphyry style gold plus or minus copper molybdenum. More important is a distal disseminated gold, silver, lead, copper deposit. Tanabo has gold, copper, scarn. And then a big question is, are there any Carlin type deposits associated with this episode? And it's possible that Tanabo, but not necessarily of this age. I mean, it's possible that Tanabo has a Carlin type deposit, uh, but it may not be a 39 million year. And so I'm going to zoom in now to the hilltop area and look at this in a little bit more detail. Here's the hilltop granodiorite, and we have a hornblende argon date and a zircon uranium lead date. Very good agreement at 39.8. Oh, and I should point out that a, a bunch of the dates here from Chris Kelson et al. in his work. Uh, and he has several dates on Granite Mountain. Uh, they're sort of scattered around a bit, but they're consistent with something uh, 39.5 or 39.6 million years and effectively indistinguishable from the hilltop intrusion. Now, uh, again, the mineralization, a bunch of disseminated copper molybdenum, quartz pyrite molybdenum, calcium pyrite veins with pervasive quartz sericite pyrite alteration. But this has little gold, and this is information is largely coming from Kelson's work and Lyle and DeRocher from a long ago GSN volume. And uh, I've got a date here, 39.7 on sericite from a uh, you know, small deposit over here. Clearly, this QSP alteration is contemporaneous with the intrusive activity and presumably driven by it. Now, Kelson also got a bunch of uh, rhenium osmium molybdenite dates, so 40.2 here, 40.1, 40.2, and 40.5. And other than they're a little bit, tiny bit older than the uh, igneous rocks that are host some of them, uh, they demonstrate that this early alteration, again, is contemporaneous with this intrusive episode and presumably driven by it. Unfortunately, uh, the big deposit out here, what's called the Hilltop Gold Deposit, is not dated and probably not, at least not currently datable. 
Lyle DeRocher point out that this is geochemically a carlin type deposit. Silver gold around one, associated arsenic, and, and barite, but it's in a late host, and really it's in fact it's in a fault breccia, um, and uh, definitely not, you know, silty carbonates of the classic carlin type deposit. That doesn't preclude it being a carlin type deposit, uh, but most people think this is a uh, distal disseminated deposit um, and related to this intrusive activity, and that's a logical interpretation of it. <clears throat> so in this area, again, a lot of intermediate magmatism and a lot of mineralization, including some significant gold deposits, but maybe not any carlin type deposits. Okay. The next younger episode is still Eocene, 34 to 36, 40 million year old episode. First of all, it's more widespread. We find these rocks throughout this area. Um, it's more voluminous, notably the Caetano Tuff and the Caetano Caldera, very large explosive rubber eruption. Uh, and it has, particularly, it has a lot of high silica rock. both with the Caetano caldera and then the second. Some of this magmatism was very important for mineralization and as we we're gonna see, some of it wasn't. Okay, we've zoomed into the Cortez area again here and we've done a lot of work, others have done a lot of work uh, and part of the reason is this is a really good opportunity to precisely date a major the the low silver rock like 70 to 72 percent SiO2 um, mostly very altered. Uh, uh, everything in and around close to Cortez Hills is altered. Uh, <laughs> all the mineralogy is destroyed. However, Bob Leonardson and I found a nice, relatively fresh sample on an excavation that uh, uh, Barrick was mating, making for its um, conveyor belt and it had fresh biotite and biotite and zircon dates agree at 36.3 million years. Others of these, uh, we got these all from core uh, in the Cortez Hills deposit and so on, and they're altered. Uh, everything is zircon dating with fairly large uncertainties, but you can see they range from 36 to as old as about 36.9, and that overlaps with and is consistent with these dates, uh, consistent that this is an older, slightly older pulse of these Cortez rhyolites. Now the bigger pulse and the more important in timing in dating mineralization is a bunch of high silica rhyolite dikes. Uh, they have 75 to 77 percent silica. Uh, Phenocrysts are quartz, sanidine, plagioclase, and biotite. And the presence of sanidine is really important because that can be dated very, very precisely and it provides a very tight age constraint on these rocks. Now, uh, uh, you can see a bunch of dates in outcrop, and then there's a bunch of dates on rocks from core. Uh, a mean uh, standard deviation of all those dates, 35.70 plus or minus 0 0.05 million years. I don't remember how many of that was, but it was a lot. And both the, the not mineralized Cortez rhyolite dikes and the mineralized have the same age range and mean age. So they were placed uh, approximately, well, indistinguishably at the same time, uh, but some are mineralized and some are not. And that's a real key point. Um, we see some things that are very strongly mineralized. They're even ore grade in some cases uh, of these rhyolite dikes. And then we see other things that are completely unaltered. For example, you'll see a dike with a marginal vitrophere that's right up against ore grade material and uh, it clearly has not undergone substantial hydrothermal alteration. These are very intimately associated with the Cortez Hills deposit. You can see it from the map view here. Uh, you can see it here. 
this is a view of the Cortez Hills pit. These white stripes on the high walls, those are a bunch of the rhyolite dikes. And there's a nice swarm of them through here. There's some more over here. There's just a lot of them in, the, in and around the pit. Uh, this line here is a cross section from Barrick. Here it is. This is a section from Jackson et al. and Arbonius et al. from the 2010 symposium volume. And a point made by uh, Barrick people, particularly by um, Kevin Creel, is that the ore zones, and here's the breccia zone here and the lower zone here, these things are very tightly uh, intimately associated with these rhyolite dikes. And you can see from this cross section how abundant those dikes are in this area. The, uh, uh, these two dike zones here basically bracket the breccia zone, the mineralization zone. They do cut the breccia, so they're younger than that. Uh, but as we're going to see, they include some very strongly mineralized rocks. And so here is an example of that. This is a photograph of a core piece of core uh, of one of these high silica rhyolites. It is somewhat altered, uh, but the sanidine was sufficiently preserved that I could get a good date out of it, 35.59. It's actually, curiously, one of the younger dates, but it overlaps in uncertainty with the others. And it contains a bunch of pyrite and realgar on this fracture surface. Clearly, this is hypogene mineralization. It's not any sort of super gene enrichment. And, uh, John Montine has looked a bunch of the geochemical and mineralogical characteristics of these rocks, and there's a bunch of stuff here. I won't go through all of it, simply to point out that some of these things are distinctly mineralized. And here's a thin section billet of one of the Cortez rhyolites. Uh, note that it has three and a half ppm gold, a lot of mercury, a lot of arsenic. Clearly, this, these, some of these rhyolites are very strongly mineralized, even ore grade whereas some of them are not altered and not mineralized. And what that says is that these dikes came in at the, basically the end of the carlin-type mineralization. So the end of carlin-type mineralization is about 35.7. Uh, there's some recent work by Ken Hickey on the duration of carlin-type deposit mineralization hydrothermal systems in the carlin trend, and he suggests they last in that case, 50,000 years. If this applies to the Cortez area, then 35.7, that is the age of the Cortez Hills deposit. And here's just another picture of these dikes in the Cortez Hills pit. Uh, they generally are not ore because the, the interior, the devitrified interior is mostly quartz and feldspar, so it's very non-reactive. And then this white zone along here and the narrowing down where the dike narrows down here and along through here, is a smectite altered uh, uh, former vitrophere. And what this says, the you know, fluids of whatever sort got to these vitrophires, altered them to smectite, and that just made them very impermeable. So uh, lack of permeability and non-reactivity, the dikes are not very good ore. And this addresses a, a question that goes back a long time, a debate about whether these dikes were pre or post ore. And the answer is, well, they're both. Uh, some of them are definitely pre-ore and are mineralized, and some of them are post-ore and are not. Okay, this then bears upon uh, sort of the origin of Cortez Hills and of, of uh, carlin-type deposits in this area again. This shows our known and possible carlin-type deposits and distribution of Cortez-type rhyolite dikes. Uh, and this dashed line here uh, shows the distribution of, of the high silica Cortez rhyolites, and they go as far north as Tanabo, where there are several dikes in here that have the same age, phenocris assemblage composition as the dikes in the immediate Cortez Hills area here. There's also uh, one of these dikes and a, a rhyolite lava dome down in here that are also the same story. So the Cortez rhyolite dikes make this elongate, northwest elongate band through here. Note that Cortez Hills and Cortez are right on top of that. Pipeline is off the western edge, and then Gold Rush and Four Mile are along the eastern edge in the smaller Horse Canyon deposit uh, along the eastern edge of this band. And what this band of rhyolite dikes tells us 
is that there's an underlying granitic granitic pluton that makes and also was the heat source for the hydrothermal system that certainly drove Cortez Hills and Cortez. I suspect that's also the case for pipeline and gold rush and four mile. Pipeline is nearly impossible to date. We'll discuss that in a minute. And gold rush and four mile are really too new to have any dating that I'm at least aware of. And the implication of this large granitic pluton, uh, it's a very important point. Um, it is not the dikes. The dikes crop out uh, the It's the underlying pluton that fed those dikes. And so here, this is a cartoon for Mike Russell's and my work in the uh, Northern Carlin trend. And, you know, it's, uh, it's somewhat cartoonish, but it's also uh, realistic. Uh, no vertical exaggeration, horizontal scale, vertical scale. And what you see in the Northern Carlin trend is just a bunch of dikes, felsic dikes, similar to what we see in the Cortez area. Now, some very nice uh, aeromagnetic data by Newmont and interpreted by Mark Goldie shows that the intrusions, the major intrusions that fed these dikes are down here at six to eight kilometers depth. So they are what are we're driving the hydrothermal systems in the uh, Carlin trend, and we simply see the dikes up at the surface. Very similar system in uh, uh, Cortez. Okay, now, um, because the age of Carlin type deposits has been a key issue in their uh, uh, interpretation of their origin, uh, I'm going to look at a little bit of data from Pipeline here, which has had a, quite a bit said about it, published about it, uh, but it's a little uh, confused, let's say. Now, first of all, Pipeline, notice, is just east of the Gold Acres intrusion and the small Gold Acres Carlin type deposit, which is right here. And the, gold, the 105 million old Gold Acres intrusion did generate a lot of hydrothermal activity. Silverman McKee recognized this long ago, uh, KER dates on sericite. Uh, more recently, there's been some argon-argon dating uh, in the pipeline area. And this is Blamey et al., 2017 paper in minerals. And they did argon-argon dating of sericite from a quartz sericite pyrite visible gold vein that was drilled into beneath pipeline, and then mixed diagenetic epigenetic illite. <clears throat> This is the uh, uh, sericite from that vein, uh, sort of a curious spectrum, but you can see it ranges from about 110 to 100 million years, the flat part here. And this is very consistent with it, the vein being generated by the uh, hydrothermal system related to the 105 million year old gold acres intrusion. Similarly, these spectra up here uh, are from the mixed diagenetic epigenetic illite. And what you see are some high temperature steps that retain the sort of Paleozoic provenance of these. But then there's flat parts of the spectra that are all around, again, 100, 100 to 110 million years. And so these uh, uh, illites were largely reset or maybe grew some new epigenetic uh, illite at the same time. So a lot of alteration in the Cretaceous related to the gold acres and trees. Now, an important around it, the pipeline deposit is in as post date are. Now that's all it says though, and that gives us a wide age range. Um, another attempt to date pipeline deposit was Earhart and Donalek, who did a bunch of appetite fission track dating uh, on samples collected around the uh, uh, pipeline deposit. And these are accurately located. Here's pipeline and its many pit, and here's the gold acres pit. And you can see there's a range from 97, uh, there's a 63 and a 67 here, down to as low as 13, 12.8 million years on these appetite fission track dates. 
the bag. And somebody is talking. Hi. Um, Earhart and Donalick, uh, they selected seven of these appetite fishing tracks dates that were near 40 million years, and they averaged them and got 38.7 plus or minus two. And of course, averaging seven near 40 and coming up with 38.7 makes a lot of mathematical sense. But they also said that this represents the best constraint that the appetite fission track data provide on the timing of the cessation of the major thermal event and by inference, the mineralizing event at pipeline. And I've written down here, no, and that applies to the second paragraph also. And if I could have come up with a bigger font, I would have. Um, these data don't show any such thing. These show a great spread in ages. It's not clear fully really why, but there's no particular correlation of 40 million year old dates than there is say of 20 million year old dates. One could just as easily have said, well, I'm gonna select tw seven 20 million year old dates and come up with an average around 20 uh, as it's selecting seven 40 million year dates. By selecting those, they assume the answer. Seven dates near 40 million years are gonna give something near 40 million years. It is not evidence that the pipeline deposit formed at that time it may have, but we don't know. They also recognize, of course, that there were a bunch of younger dates, 13, 13, essentially 14, 13. And their explanation for that is this represents a thermal activity associated with development of the Northern Nevada Rift. Uh, no, it doesn't do that either. And I'll show you why. Here again are all these dates plotted here. Here now is pipeline. Here's the Northern Nevada Rift. It's 10 kilometers off to the east quite a ways from pipeline and there are no uh, northern Nevada rift age rocks anywhere around pipeline. Moreover, the igneous rocks, and we've got a bunch of dates on them here, and they are all around 16 million years. The northern Nevada rift here, the igneous activity was all right around 16 million years, and 16 million year activity uh, that's quite a ways away cannot lead to uh, a 13 more to 14 million year old cooling event at pipeline 10 kilometers off to the west. What we can conclude about pipeline is we don't know how old it is. Uh, it's a very oxidized deposit, which is really good for mining, but it makes it really difficult to do any hard scientific study. And certainly we cannot date it. And I would say at this time, it is not datable by any of the existing dating methods we have. Okay, just for continuity and completion, uh, I'm gonna look at a little bit younger mineralization. Uh, here's the Caetano caldera, uh, which is just you know, southwest of the big Cortez deposits. We've dated that a lot. It's, it's 34.0 million years, both the, the erupted ash flow tuff and a bunch of immediately post-collapse intrusions. They all come out 34.0 million years. In the western part of the cold air has this very large hydrothermal alteration package that uh, David John analyzed very thoroughly. And what he found, 100 square kilometer, 120 kilometer square area of advanced argillic, intermediate argillic, residual buggy quartz. Uh, a lot of samples were anomalous in arsenic, barium, mercury, molybdenum, a bunch of other trace elements, but notably, Gold and silver were all, almost all, below detection limit. Uh, I'll briefly also, oh, and, and Dave interpreted these to uh, be the result of uh, magmatic degassing of the residual Caetano magma chamber, generating a hydrothermal fluid that interacted with a lot of meteoric water, essentially a lake, in the uh, caldera, intracaldera basin. One other minor bit of uh, alteration, we found a sort of a desktop size outcrop of UST, unidirectional solidification texture, which was brand new to me. Uh, but these are characteristic of volatile rich cupolas associated with mineralization elsewhere, for example, the uh, Henderson molybdenum deposit. Uh, and it sort of suggests that uh, the Caetano magma system gave a last gasp, failing attempt to generate some sort of uh, Motley Porphyry system. And the point of all this is uh, Caetano has some hydrothermal alteration, but definitely doesn't have anything mineable. And it uh, reinforces a point several people made that blowing a large amount of magma, in this case about 1,100 cubic kilometers of 
chitano tough magma and all the contained metals and volatiles in the, the air is not a good way to generate ore deposits. Okay, uh, and, and sort of going to uh, last little bit of igneous activity and mineralization in the Cortez area, the Middle Miocene Northern Nevada Rift. And I already, already noted uh, that uh, it's got a lot of 16 million year old, uh, mostly basaltic andesite lava flows and dikes. Um, and the Northern Nevada Rift has a lot of associated epithermal, uh, low sulfidation, precious metal deposits. Two here, Fire Creek up in the north, and uh, Justin Milliard has done a lot of work on that with Klondex and now Hecla, and dated Agilaria there at about 16 million years. The Buckhorn deposit down here uh, just has an old potassium argon date of 15 million years, again on Agilaria. Be nice to get a new date uh, on that to see if it's really 15 or it's closer to 16 or, or what it is, um, but haven't done that yet. Okay, so a concluding comment about this first part, the longer first part of this talk about all the igneous activity and hydrothermal alteration here. We see these distinct episodes, Jurassic 160, 162, Cretaceous pretty around 109, but as we saw a whole lot more Cretaceous intrusions and then two episodes of Eocene 39 to 40, that, and then the 34 to 36. This, of course, has the uh, Cortez Hills Carlin deposits, possibly some of the other uh, Carlin type deposits here, and then the Middle Miocene. Each of these generated major diverse hydrothermal systems. All of them have mines in them, they produce something, and these kinds of magmatic hydrothermal episodes are spatially superimposed, uh, and that's particularly true in the Cortez Hills area, also true at Pipeline, where Cortez Hills has Jurassic, all these Cretaceous, Eocene, and the Middle Miocene, Northern Nevada Rift over here. And the superposition greatly complicates interpreting age and origin of deposits in general, and is a, it is a, a situation that we see throughout northern Nevada, throughout the Great Basin. Uh, for example, the Carlin trend has exactly the same Jurassic, Cretaceous, Eocene, and Middle Miocene magmatic height and hydrothermal episodes. Okay, that's conclusion of part one, and now a brief part two. Uh, and what does this all say about Carlin type deposits in general? Well, this map shows these blue lines are igneous cron tours showing the migration of Cenozoic magmatism south and west across the Great Basin to here in Nevada. And this show, and we're additionally showing all the uh, uh, known Carlin type deposits and what we have on information about their age. And uh, there's some that are pretty well dated, and there's many that are not. But they, the information we have is consistent with the Carlin-type deposits younging to the south and west and paralleling the, mag the migration of magmatism here. So that certainly supports the model that many people propose where magmatism is at least the heat source for Carlin-type deposits. And, and then of course, um, uh, you know, maybe also the source of metals and we'll address that a little bit here in a second. But it also brings up uh, what I call the Getchell Twin Creeks enigma. And, and here's Twin Creeks, here's Getchell. Uh, these have some distinctive minerals that are not commonly found in Carlin type deposits. Twin Creeks has a lot of Agilaria, and that's been well dated at 42 and a half million years. Getchell has Galkaite, a weird mineral that I won't, whose composition I won't even try to uh, reproduce. Um, and it indicates mineralization at 39 million years, but with a fairly large uncertainty. So Getchell and Twin Creeks have some of the strongest geochronologic evidence for Eocene Carlin type mineralization. But as most of you know, uh, despite a lot of people looking, nobody has ever found any Eocene rocks, certainly no Eocene intrusive rocks in and around this. Now, you go out from them, and there are certainly other Eocene rocks, but there's nothing close to the Twin Creeks. So why that? Well, think back to the evidence from Cortez of these hidden Cretaceous intrusions and Marigold of hidden Cretaceous and Jurassic intrusions. 
And I'm going to give you one more example. I'm going to look over here at the Pequot Mountains, the site of the Long Canyon deposit, where we, uh, a bunch of we, have done a bunch of new mapping, building upon mapping by Thorman a long time ago, and then Camilleri more recently. Uh, and this shows the three quadrangles we've mapped, very simplified view. And what uh, you know, all of us are, are noticing is that this also has these multiple episodes of igneous activity. Um, here's the Long Canyon deposit. Um, this color, these are Jurassic dikes. There's a whole lot of Jurassic dikes around here. Particularly, there's a lot of them, including many lamprophiers in the Long Canyon deposit. We have a data box. 163 here. Um, other dates are from our work and from Camilleri and Bedell et al. Um, and there's the, the Jurassic is widespread through the Pequot Mountains. Uh, there's a tiny bit of Cretaceous um, and really tiny and I think it's Cretaceous. They're very difficult rocks to date. They're two mica garnet luco granites to make very thin little uh, sills in through here. But more importantly, there's a big swath of Eocene rhyolites through here. Uh, we plan to date these. We're sort of held up by coronavirus, but Richard Bedell got dates of 39 million years here and 41 million years here. So these are clearly, clearly Eocene dikes. The important point about the Pequot Mountains is it is strongly tilted and extended. It dips, it's tilted 40 degrees to the east uh, these Eocene dikes are down here in the bottom of the section down in Cambrian rocks. Without this tilting, these Eocene, whoops, sorry, these dikes would be down at five to six kilometers depth. We'd have no hope of seeing them. We would not know there was anything to indicate Eocene rhyolite dikes at depth. Nevertheless, because of the tilting, because of a very specific much later, probably middle Miocene tectonic episode, the tilting has allowed us to see them. But the point is, these rhyolites are down there, they're intrusions, they're probably also out of a large granitic intrusion, uh, which could be indicated there's a very large aeromag anomaly off just to the southeast here. Uh, although we, we can interpret that it's related to an intrusion, but we don't know if it's uh, Eocene or Cretaceous or something else. But these dikes are here, but we wouldn't know about them without the tilting. Okay, so back to this plot uh, and back to Getchell Twin Creeks. We have strong evidence that it's Eocene hydrothermal activity generated the Carlin-type deposits. And the evidence from Cortez Hills from uh, uh, Marigold over in here in the Pequot Mountains is there's probably substantial large Eocene intrusions at depth. Twin Creeks is not tilted, uh, so we don't see down to five to six kilometers depth. But if we could, we would probably see uh, these large intrusions. We certainly have a better chance to see some dikes. But in this case, neither the intrusions nor the dikes propagated anywhere close enough to the surface to be seen either an outcrop or any of the drilling. And I think the drilling has gone to, oh, well, maybe 1.3 kilometers in the Getchell Twin Creek. But the, the timing of activity there uh, and the association of Carlin type deposits with Eocene intrusions really strongly argues that they're down there. Now, a, a further question of Carlin type deposits is what is the source of metals? And that's a much longer discussion. Uh, I, I put it in the abstract, but I also realized I didn't have time to talk about it. So I'm just going to make a brief comment. Um, here's the uh, very interesting Montine et al. magmatic hydrothermal origin of Nevada's Carlin type gold deposits. And they have a, uh, they came up with a series of uh, sort of factors and processes that generate Carlin type deposits. And it starts with mantle activity and goes right up to the upper crust. Um, starts with flat slab subduction uh, and very intense hydration of the overlying mantle lithosphere. Then roll back of that flat slab to generate the Cenozoic magmatism from that hydrated mantle lithosphere. Those magmas rising through, uh, interacting with the crust and evolving uh, particularly their, um, 
uh, volatile phases, uh, volatile components evolving, undergoing various exolution, eventually generating a Carlin type hydrothermal fluid that way up here interacted with silty carbonates to generate uh, Carlin type deposits. Now, a lot of this is very detailed geochemistry, mineralogy, uh, things, uh, uh, aspects of economic geology that I just don't do and, and don't really well understand. As a very basic geologist, I look at geologic correlations. And what I'm suggesting here is that we see a geologic correlation between deeply emplaced plutons and the biggest, best Carlin type deposits. That is, the biggest, best. Northern Carlin Trend, the Cortez area, probably Getchell Twin Creeks. These deposits developed above deeply emplaced high silica, i.e. granitic plutons. And we can argue that very strongly at uh, Cortez uh, and the Northern Carlin Trend. Uh, in contrast, shallowly emplaced granodiorites are much less favorable for Carlin type deposits doesn't mean that they can't have them. I'm just saying that they're less favorable. And an example of that would be the um, uh, Battle Mountain area, which has a whole bunch of Eocene granodiorite intrusions, very shallowly in place. They have major gold mineralization, uh, you know, gold copper scarns at Fortitude and, and uh, uh, Phoenix, but they have very few, if any, and very small Carlin type deposits. Doesn't mean that there couldn't be Carlin type deposits at depth underneath Battle Mountain. Uh, I don't know of any. And my conclusion is that the biggest best are associated with these high silica granitic plutons. And that may partly because such plutons, by in place being, being placed fairly deeply, they're not going to lose anything to the atmosphere. They're not going to erupt uh, explosively or otherwise. Whatever volatiles, metals they have are trapped in the crust, and if the right processes work, then they're going to generate a Carlin-type deposit. A shallowly in place granodiorite uh, can generate major deposits, but probably not major Carlin-type deposits. And that's it for tonight. Thank you very much, and uh, I would welcome any questions. <laughs> okay. Chris, if you could stop sharing. Yep. Thank, thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk as always um, and pretty intriguing. Um, I think the way we're going to do questions is that um, as a co-host, I can't raise my hand to ask a question, uh, but I think most of you can. So if you have questions, use that raise hand icon or use the chat function and we will go one by one, I think first come first serve and uh, address your questions accordingly. So um, if we can, we've got a couple chats already showing up here. Um, uh, Jason Price, uh, what is the oldest zircon xenocris that you found in the Cortez area, Chris? Oh, uh, we found a bunch. I mean, I talked a lot about the Cretaceous, uh, but we found uh, Proterozoic, uh, certainly going back into the 1700, 1800 million year range, uh, a lot of Paleozoic, and these presumably were coming out of the Paleozoic sedimentary section there, maybe um, the underlying uh, late Proterozoic sedimentary rocks. Uh, and, and we found uh, definitely Jurassic zircons that match the um, uh, Jurassic Mill Canyon intrusion. I really emphasize the Cretaceous just because that was such new information. And I don't, uh, I don't think we got any uh, Archean zircons. Um, I'd have to check that to be certain. I, I should have thought that somebody might ask about that. Um, I think the oldest things we got were mostly around 1,800 million years, presumably coming out of the Paleozoic or Neoproterozoic sedimentary rocks. Other questions for Chris? Come on, everyone. Got to have a few. I think the uh, $64,000 question is, um, you've got these diverse styles of magnetism, lots going on in the Jurassic, Cretaceous, Eocene, Miocene, but why 
Carlin type deposits only in the late Eocene um, and specifically from 36 to 34 MA. Well, I think 36 to 34 is only the, is only the case in the Cortez area. You know, obviously in the Northern Carlin trend, some of the older intrusions, um, you know, have mineralization associated with them. Um, and I briefly said something about this in the abstract, but then I realized there's really not much time to talk about it. And, you know, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and Eocene magmas all are broadly subduction related. They originated in the, in the mantle. They rose, interacted a lot with the crust. Um, and in the Eocene, in, in many cases, uh, some of the Eocene magmas are almost 100% crust. Um, and really it's going to require a lot more petrogenetic work to figure out how these things differ. Now, your work, you know, you, Curtis Johnson, Philip Rupek, for example, pointed out the difference in oxidation state of magmas going from the western part of the Great Basin over to Utah, where things get a lot more oxidized and in contrast magmas in, uh, say, the Battle Mountain area get very reduced as they interact with reducing Paleozoic sedimentary rocks. Uh, and these, these kinds of things, crustal interactions and their influence on magmatic compositions and a bunch of, uh, you know, what are they called, variables, uh, FO2 and, and water contents, things like that. I think those are very important uh, they're not something I'm going to do much with. Um, I really hope there's an awful more major trinic and kind of stuff that you first built up. And a long list of chat things. I don't know what they are. Okay, yeah, you're uh, breaking up for me. I don't know if you're breaking up for others. Um, oh, Sandra um, Wilde. Yeah, uh, Jason. Price so is a follow-up question about and Cortez. Feel free to click on your video, Alex. Oh, Mike, we uh, sorry. Watch you again. Can you guys You're hear good. me? Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, Sandra, uh, did you have a question? I just wanted to ask Chris a question. Sure. Go ahead. It's written in the chats. Okay. Oh, let's work our so if I go to all points, if you were to slice 10 kilometers off the crust in the basement range, would it be largely plutonic rocks of Mesozoic and Cenozoic age? I think it likely, yeah. yes. Um, and if so, what does this mean about seismic interpretations of the basement and range? Oh boy, I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to comment on the last part. Um, but you do think that the first part yeah. might be correct. Um, you know, I, for you know, there's a major caldera, Cenozoic caldera belt going across Nevada, and I would say they're definitely underlain by major, large plutonic bodies, effectively a, a mid-Cenozoic uh, batholith belt. Uh, but then, um, you know, I was really somewhat surprised by the abundance of Cretaceous intrusions that we found, um, you know, from all these different lines of evidence, the the marigold work sort of shows some of the same thing. Uh, Eric Gottlieb, a graduate student at uh, Stanford, has been doing work farther east, sort of towards the Snake Range, and finding very similar things. And I think all this is telling us that there are a lot of uh, pretty Cretaceous, but probably also uh, Jurassic intrusion in the subsurface. And, and people have mentioned several examples of that where drilling hit some Jurassic intrusion, for example, in the Carlin Trend area uh, or Battle Mountain that does not crop out and nobody knew about it except for the drilling. So I think if you went down, you'd see a lot of intrusive rock. And that well, certainly could complicate seismic interpretation. That's as well, much as I well, can Let me revise the second part of the question yeah. then. Does this mean that the, the, the Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks strata, rather, that we see outcropping at the surface 
are really sort of roof rocks to a gigantic poly age plutonic complex? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure about that. You know, uh, you know, they're they're down there at some depth. Uh, you know, my understanding of geology doesn't really extend much below the surface that I can see, uh, and I'd be very reluctant to talk about. Uh, things down at say 10 kilometers. I mean, I see, you know, a bunch of processes affecting what's down there. These multiple episodes of intrusion, various contractional and then extensional episodes. Uh, there's a lot of magmatic and tectonic shuffling going along that really would complicate things. Wow, it raises lots of interesting questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, thank you. We have another question from Celestine Mercer. She says, thanks for the awesome talk, Chris. What other geologic correlations do you think are important between deep and shallow intrusion, deep versus shallow intrusions, or low silica versus high silica intrusions that might make a difference for a Carlin formation? For example, we get deep and shallow porphyry deposits. Yeah, and let me emphasize, I'm a geologic mapper. I, I've worked a fair amount on economic geology aspects, but I never would claim to be an economic geologist. And so lots of things about uh, oh, mineralogical geochemical assemblages that are you know, critical to economic geology, something I don't really know a lot about. Uh, but uh, what I would say is that these different magma compositions, um, to the extent we've looked at, you know, for example, some of the high silica rhyolites in the Cortez Caetano area, they've undergone some significant uh, magmatic differentiation evolution um, and different for different Swedes. And for example, the Caetano tough magma gets highly enriched in niobium. Now, niobium is, you know, sort of irrelevant to. Uh, Carlin type deposits, but it shows that the Caetano tough magma underwent uh, somewhat similar but also somewhat very different um, geochemical evolution than Cortez and and this could you know, reflect a whole bunch of things. I think it does reflect magmatic composition, but it may be many different aspects. The evolution and what happens to, in this case, say gold, as that magma evolves, um, the volatile contents, um, oxygen fugacity, many other things. And these are maybe, you know, sort of their derivative aspects of the magma composition but they may be what's really critical in, in determining what kind of deposits occur. But that's, I, I emphasize, that's pretty speculative. I, if, I, if I could just give a short and much more honest answer it would be, I don't know. I don't know either. Pedro Delios though, knows that he has a question. He says, great magmatic story. Uh, why would the high silica versus slightly older lower silica rhyolites be more closely associated with gold mineralization at Cortez Hills. And I think we've discussed this a little bit perhaps, but you can carry on. Um, and let, let me just add to that, you know, I think a very significant factor that shows up at Cortez and the Northern Carlin Trend and, and potentially at uh, the Pequot Mountains and Getchell Twin Creeks is that uh, some of these rocks, the, the Grand Ordarites in the Cortez area were very shallowly emplaced and they generated a bunch of uh, more distal disseminated type of deposits. That gets into the question of a continuity between Carlin type and distal disseminated, more directly igneous related deposits. Uh, and that may be uh, partly a, a function of depth of emplacement. If the granodiorite gets up real close to the surface, which is the case in Cortez and Battle Mountains, it's gonna have certain kinds of deposits and maybe not Carlin type deposits. Gabe has a question. Um, thank you, Chris. The Cortez rhyolites are outlined in a north northwest corridor parallel to the northern Nevada rift. Any comment why there might be a linear control or is there 
or is this more an exposure or tilt product? Um, I think there could be a real control. You know, uh, several people, oh, Dick Tostel, et cetera, um, have pointed out the influence of the rifting of the North, the Lake Pro Resort rifting of the North American continent and a bunch of North Northwest uh, striking structures. The Carlin trend is North Northwest. This zone is North Northwest. Uh, and the Northern Nevada rift is North Northwest. Now that was initially interpreted to reflect East Northeast extension, but a bunch of people, um, various geophysical work by the survey, uh, Vicki Langenheim and others, and then analysis of the Northern Nevada rift by Joe Colgan suggested that actually the Northern Nevada rift is reflecting these basement structures and that is what's determining the orientation. And I think that could be the case with the, uh, you know, the Cortez Rhyolites here. Okay, very good. Elizabeth Holly, you're on. Hey, thank you so much, Chris. This was really great and really intriguing. The thing that's bothered me is these areas where we don't have the ESC magnetism like, like we do in Cortez Hills. Um, my group has been working on some samples from the Yukon Magnet, and there's just really a paucity of a rich magmatic history. And I'm curious with your, your credentials as an accomplished mapper, do you think we just need to get out there and find those rocks, or are there more, more ways to bake a Carlin cake? Uh, well, I, I, I very much value geologic mapping, and something I would point out about all these areas well, particularly the Carlin trend uh, and say the Pequot Mountains, um, and, and so I said the Cortez area also, a lot of the igneous rocks there, oh, particularly the Lamprefiers, some of these small dikes, um, the Lamprefiers get very altered <clears throat> and you know they just don't crop out. Uh, you might find some float of them in the, in the uh, you know, in soil. Uh, but it would be really easy to miss them. I mean, a lot of these, in the Carlin trend, a lot of these dikes were missed for a long time. Um, that's somewhat true in the Cortez area, uh, certainly true in the Pequot Mountains. It's only been uh, relatively recent mapping, uh, partly by us, partly by company mapping, that has really recognized how abundant these things were. If you look at old maps, of the, the Pequot Mountains, for example, they, they don't show much in the way of igneous rocks. They turn out they're there, but because they're just small, easily uh, altered, weathered, eroded dikes, they're really hard to find. And so, you know, in the Yukon area, you know, maybe they're out there, but they could be really hard to find. And in particular, where you're talking about, they could be really hard to find. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, you know, there is the Tombstone Tentina belt of plutons that stretches all the way across from eastern Alaska all the way through to the Northwest Territories, Elizabeth, and you're well aware of that. Um, those, those plutons have mineral systems, gold-rich mineral systems associated with them, but then there's this huge area that's underlain by Yukon um, moss that, uh, you know, tundra essentially that uh, is difficult to see through and difficult to map in a detailed fashion. Well, fingers crossed then. Yeah, and I, I would add, you know, in Nevada, it's a little easier because there are major exposures of all these things. So we know that the rocks are out there and it's just turning out that the rocks are a lot more abundant than we previously realized. By the way, there's a, a paper in the new 2020 GSN volume by Beth Fisher, who works for the Northwest Territories Geological Survey, and she's published this 60 or 70 page uh, tome on their detailed mapping in the western part of the Northwest Territories, addresses the Carlin type potential and describes a lot of magnetism. Well, thanks, Mike and Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we've got a lot more in terms of questions. We got to move on here. Dante Huff, love the talk, Chris. If rhyolite dikes can stall out at five to six kilometers depth, 
what physical processes or mechanisms do you think allow the fluids to travel all the way to the upper two kilometers while still maintaining the necessary chemistry to form economic Carlin type deposits? Solely crustal structures? I am not the right person to address that question. <laughs> you, John Muntean, many others can say something about that. Uh, um, you know, clearly Carlin type deposits exist, so the fluids came from somewhere and got there. That's, that's as good as I can do. I, I, you know, crustal structures, uh, fracture control, you know, I think that's obviously important. Wherever there's permeability, that's good. And uh, a bunch of people pointed out that, um, uh, you know, Carlin tide deposits particularly are formed in anticlines related to probably Mesozoic contraction. And that's where hydrothermal fluids bond. They're sort of black gold. Uh, they're, they're the gold part of black gold type mineralization. Mm -hmm. That's a very uh, difficult question that Dante poses. And, um, you know, stay tuned for yeah. that's, uh, more in the future. That's not one I can say much about. Yeah. Nansen Olson, who's working in Nevada on his PhD, has a question. Um, Hi, Nansen. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. He says, can you say a few comments on the presence of xenoliths, their size and abundance, and their textures? For example, are there Paleozoic and other Eocene plutonic rocks contained in Eocene magmatism, like contained in Eocene magmas that you have mapped? Do their textures give clues to the depth of emplacement? Uh, um, we can say something about depth of emplacement by where the intrusions are in the stratigraphy. Um, don't really see much in the way of xenoliths in any of the intrusive rocks. Uh, there are a few, but they're, they're really not abundant. Uh, the, the zircon xenocris, you know, we don't uh, see um, a lot of actual inclusions in the rocks that have these xenocris. And actually, I'm going to back up and cite one example. Uh, one of the post ash flow tough, post caldera collapse intrusions in the Caetano caldera has a, a bunch of, of uh, probably McCoy Creek Group and uh, Prospect Mountain Quartzite xenoliths. And that's the one intrusion I can think of that really has a lot of xenoliths in it. Yeah. I can Otherwise, comment on that uh, a little bit for Nansen. The more basaltic rocks um, can oftentimes have xenoliths in them of more mafic material. Um, and in the southern Carlin trend, many of the basaltic andesite dikes and small intrusions are loaded with olivine rich xenoliths. Um, and, um, and they have strange quartz, resorbed quartz, large quartz xenoliths as well, uh, which are enigmatic. And Chris, you know about those in the Mat Creek uh, lavas from the Carlin trend, uh, also kind of enigmatic. Okay. Um, and that's shown by many uh, features. Uh, but mostly the, uh, you know, the crustal stuff that they incorporate is sufficiently digested that it just shows up as, you know, isotopes, uh, chemical composition, and zircon xenocris. And both the good and bad of zircon xenocris is they can survive an awful lot. Question. Chuck. Yeah. Uh Chris, yeah. a question and a comment. First of all, postage stamp mapping over a, a huge envelope gives you a lot of data, whereas when you map just one little small area, you're left with a hell of a lot more questions that you will ever be able to answer. And I think what you've done with pulling this. 
I'm dude, I'm waiting. I know that. You need a weather to do a construction. How much would it pull all of these other deposits together in that area? Um, well, that's actually a very interesting question. Um, you know, obviously the Great Basin is substantially extended. And so take out roughly west extends back there. Uh, in the case of the uh, Cortez area, um, there's, a, there's a, a gradient in the magnitude of extension. The Northern Nevada Rift, despite being a distinct rift zone, is really very really extended. And the Cortez, the Cortez Fall, uh, you get into the very highly extended uh, Caetano Caldera, which is, uh, has been doubled in width, 100% extension. And uh, our paper, Joe Colgan, Dave John, and my paper in economic geology um, several years ago, 2014, talks about major extension in the northern Shoshone range. But again, there's a gradient going eastward into the northern Nevada Rift where it really drops off. So taking out that extension would press things back together. Uh, I haven't tried to do a reconstruction and say where uh, pipeline, Cortez Hills, and all that would be. Uh, Cortez Hills wouldn't move very far relative to uh, uh, Gold Rush and Four Mile. Uh, it would move some relative to pipeline. And I'd, you know, I'd have to really sit down and sort of calculate how much that would be. Yeah. I mean, there, isn't there some of the, the pipeline type rocks are found out in the middle of the valley between there and Cortez? Uh, not directly between Pipeline and Cortez. To the north, there is, uh, um, what is it, Hot Springs area uh, that has a bunch of, I think, Jurassic, definitely Cretaceous, other outcrops. Um, you know, I know Barrick has a significant seismic line, I think it is, across Crescent Valley. Um, I've never seen that. Um, that potentially could say a fair amount about how much extension across there. Uh, Chuck, this is Jeff here. Uh, if you invoke a few thousand feet of strike along the Cortez Fault, you can quilt that back together fairly well. Okay, but, but you wouldn't eliminate the valley. From Cortez Hills to the, the pipeline? I mean, from uh, all the way across the valley, you're not going to squeeze it range to range and ruin everything in the valley, right? That's right. Yes. You know, there's Crescent Valley uh, is a major basin. Um, there's a fair amount of extension across it, but if you took out extension, pipeline wouldn't set up the be up against the uh, Cortez range. It'd still be pretty far out there. Hang on, Mike, you're muted. Ooh. There oh, you go. Um, Molly, I don't know if you have all your chat questions. I lost mine and I can't get back to the uh, um, questions that were online. I think Jeff Blackman actually had a question about um, an east-west dike over at Tanabo, a major east-west dike, and whether that's a, a common orientation for um, presumably Eocene magnetism? Um, I don't think east-west is real common. You know, the, the dikes in the court area very strongly north-northwest. Um, I, I think I know the dike that uh, Jeff is talking about in the Tanabo, I think sort of a west-northwest, but maybe more westerly orientation of stuff in Tanabo. Um, oh, and I'm trying to remember the orientation. There's, you know, there's, Tanabo has a bunch of 39 million year old things, a, a granodiorite body and a bunch of dacite, andesite. Uh, and then it also has these 35.7 million year old Cortez rhyolites. And I remember one and, and Bob McCusker, who I saw was on here, uh, showed me these things a long time ago. Um, and, uh, oh, 
I sort of remember one, sort of the Western one being very strongly sort of east-west, and it went on for several kilometers. And that's probably telling us something, but I don't know what. Other questions for Chris? I can sit around here all night, but <laughs> that doesn't mean that anybody Nothing else to do. <laughs> Just give him a dish of ice cream. I, I can handle that. So when are you come, going to come see us at Cortez, Chris? Uh, I would like to be out there now, uh, even though this is sort of the hot time of year. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing some local field work. I'm sheltering in place. Uh, and I'm wearing my mask when I'm out in, in public in, in, in closed spaces. Um, and it, at my age, and, and at my age, everybody has a, some sort of underlying health condition. It's just a question of how much. And uh, I, I would like to get out there. I mean, I, I, it, there's a lot more to do, a lot more to do in the Cortez area. So, Well, we can meet you on the hillside. That's pretty safe. So yeah, that's just, right. Uh, just give us a heads up. Okay. Well, we'll talk. Anyone else? Well, we may okay. be beating a dead horse at this point, so. <laughs> well, fantastic talk as always, Chris, so thank you very much. Everyone join us next month. We'll have another nice talk from Mark Kulbaugh, August 27th at 7 p.m. So we'll see you there. And don't forget about the 2021 symposium now. Moving target, but uh, we hope to see you there. So stay tuned and Every now and then, check the GSN Symposium website for more stuff. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. <laughs>